Tim Morgan for his cheerful thoughtfulness as a host and his tolerance with all of my quirks. Appreciate it. I deeply appreciate the opportunity to join those who've paved the way and made the Trouble Begins at Eight Lecture Series a force to be reckoned with and a delight to look forward to. This is the first time I've actually had the opportunity to be here in person, but I've listened to all of them online and have enjoyed them deeply. This week, as Barbara was saying, is a sad one for Elmira College and for all of us, um, being grieved at the loss of Michael Kiskis. The thing that I love most about Michael's work is that he never forgot that Twain wrote about real people in real pain. And all of us here tonight who knew Michael, either in person or through his work, are in pain, and we share it. Twain, writing on the death of his daughter Jean, asked, Has anyone ever tried to put on paper all the little happenings connected with a dear one? Happenings of the 24 hours preceding the sun, sudden and unexpected death of that dear one. I think not. They pour in the mind in a flood. The news is always a shock, a moment everything changes, a moment the sky is suddenly a different color, a different sky than has ever been before or since. That's how I felt Monday as I was preparing to come here and open my email one last time and found out about Michael's death. As Twain put it, possibly I know now what the soldier feels like when a bullet crashes through his heart. For a moment our breath crashes to a halt and it seems that the world does not go on, cannot go on. But somehow, beyond all comprehension, it does. And we must learn to laugh. Twain understood intimately how pain and laughter were interrelated, that finding the laughter is crucial to survival, and that sometimes it's the only way to keep breathing and move on. The minstrel shows that Twain loved are about pain too. They come from pain, and they cause pain still. This past year alone has seen blackface images on television in talent competitions, in photographs of Hitler's mistress, Ida Braun, recently released, on Broadway in the Scottsboro Boys, and perhaps most absurdly, dancing on cupcakes in advertisements for Duck and Hines Amazing Glazes. <laughs> I don't know if any of you saw that, the little, they, they were just awful. <laughs> this is, they were even having polls online, do you think this is racist or not? Um, it was like, it kept going up, you know, 72% yes, 72% no, it was just it was waffling back and forth. One of the most difficult questions we face when looking at blackface minstrelsy is, why? Why did they do it? And why was it popular for so long? Why did Mark Twain love it? And why does it persist even today? Perhaps most puzzling of all in the question that I get asked all the time, at least for the past 11 years, is why on earth would anyone want to study it? <laughs> but the answer to this last question is truly the simplest. We study it because we must, because it hurts, and because its impact has been far-ranging and long-lasting. Scholars such as Anthony J. Barrett, Henry Wonham, and Randall Noper, two of which will be coming in the next two weeks, have done exciting work that focuses on Twain's use of the minstrel shows and their relation to broader philosophical issues and performance issues. But what I want to focus on today is the pain, specifically the minstrelsy that Twain himself singled out as exemplary. Racial derogation defines much of what we see when we look at blackface minstrelsy, and it's important to look this ugliness in the face. And what I'm going to do is, at various points, I'm going to pass around some archival materials 
that um, I have laminated so that you can look at them and see them. Part of the minstrel shows was holding on to the programs and looking at the different things that they would do. These are the way the, the books and the song books they had. They had small books like this. This is an actual one from the 19th century. The idea was that you could put it in your pocket, you could carry it with you, and then you could sing along. You could participate in the shows, was the idea. And I'm going to go ahead and pass these around. One of these is a minstrel, and I'm trying to avoid the camera right there, because these are archival materials to share for research, but not for podcasts. Um, this is a rather horrific one from the late 19th To look at the show that he loved, what sort of genuine show did they perform? The extravagant old-time minstrel show was a tradition that went beyond the boundaries of simple racial parody or stereotypic representation. He found it genuine in comparison to the shows of the day because those shows largely avoided any sort of social commentary. While racial delineation and stereotypes formed a part of the old-time minstrel shows, their humor and popularity did not depend primarily on the ridicule or parody of the black character. Rather, their focus was on using a racialized mask to deflate pretension and comment on issues of general and local significance, such as the economy, local and national politics, high culture versus low culture, social class tensions and grievances, temperance, education, social reform, changing family structures, women's rights, or the franchise. Their satire and their burlesque was punctuated by general buffoonery, while seriously performed songs of love, longing, and sentiment provided a cathartic counterpoint. For Twain, and his assessment is echoed by historians of the period, the San Francisco minstrels, Billy Birch, Charlie Backus, and Dave Wambold, and I'll be passing around a picture later that you can get closer to, were the last and greatest innovators of this old-time tradition. Further, their performance style and satiric bent was so distinctive that by general acclaim they were considered pioneers as well, creators of what was known as the Birch-Backus tradition of minstrelsy, copied by others but never with the same degree of success. And it was partly because these minstrels were as proprietary about their own brand of minstrelsy as Twain was about his works. They ruthlessly drove anybody out of business who did anything similar to what they did. They would go on stage and they would do a mockery of the minstrels who were trying to do social commentary. They would make fun of them so that people would come to their theater to see the mockery of the mockery. And the others would not sell enough tickets to be able to stay in town. So they participated, actually, in their own demise and in the demise of a form of minstrelsy that's very different from anything that we know at this point. Um, they laid the groundwork in what they did because they focused on the news for someone like Stephen Colbert, John Stewart, Dave Chappelle, Chris Rock, and others who work with current events because that's what they did. They were satirists who believed that whatever hot topic was around in the city or the country, it was fair game. They thought that the only possible fodder for a sacred cow was a stick of dynamite. And that's another thing about the minstrel stage in this era, is in wooden stages in New York City, they shot off fireworks all the time. <laughs> it, was, it was a thrill to go to the shows. Um, some of their routines are ugly with racist underpinnings, and other routines, though, question those stereotypes challenging them as essential categories, challenging ridiculousness, corruption, and pretension wherever they see it. As I said before, they were equal opportunity offenders. It didn't matter what it was. Audience flocked to their theater to get their version of the news, their satirical twist on current events. And the San Francisco minstrels excelled both in the improvisation of their end men's patter 
and in written and produced plays and skits that skewered the topic, fad, or production of the moment. And further, the San Francisco minstrels were far from a random fly-by-night example of minstrelsy that we can easily dismiss because they enjoyed unprecedented popularity at a time when other minstrel troops had to travel to survive because nobody would come see them twice. Right? Nobody would pay to come back and hear the same jokes over and over again. This troupe of minstrels stayed in New York for 18 years in three different theaters. The third theater that they had, they, they built the same year that Twain built, started building the Hartford House. 1873, the year of the financial panic when everybody else was going under. Hundreds of minstrel troops went under that year. They built a brand new theater that seated nearly 500 people and played to packed houses eight times a week. And this is a picture of the opulence of this theater. It was up at, and this is a picture of them. It was up on 29th and Broadway, so they moved way uptown. They moved further uptown than the Park Theater called them illegitimate. So they outparked the park. It was part of what they were doing. Um, they wanted to be uptown, but they kept their edge. Whereas other minstrel troops tried to be refined, they often got in trouble for their off-color performances and for their controversial, controversial digs and stings at local businessmen and politicians, which I'll talk about in a minute. But audiences flocked to see them. Twain started seeing, he, he met them in California when they were first performing there, and at the end of the Civil War they moved to New York, where he also saw them. In 1867, when he came to New York, he said, to the readers of the Alta California, our old San Francisco minstrels have made their mark here most unquestionably. Every night of their lives they play, pay, play to packed houses, every single seat full of dozens and dozens of people standing up. I have good reason to know, because I've been there pretty often myself, and have always paid my way but once, and I had to buy a box the last time I went. <laughs> In the same letter, Twain reports that the San Francisco minstrels' gross receipts for the last 12 months, as furnished to the revenue officers, were only a fraction under $110,000. Not a small sum in 1867. And Twain cared enough to look it up. <laughs> this success continued throughout their career together as they performed on, a, on the New York City stages. And when Charlie Backus died in 1883, he left his wife an estate of $350,000, while Dave Wambold, who was the singer, the tenor that Twain loved, um, his estate was still $150,000 on his death in 1889, after nine years of serious health problems that forced his early retirement. The fact that they were not only able to survive, but also to thrive in the same location for 18 years is a testament both to their performance quality and the freewheeling, spontaneous ad-lib on local politics and current events that characterize their shows. With such financial success, it's obvious that Twain wasn't the only one who found them appealing. For over a generation of New Yorkers, and as is often true of theater today, that means the world. <laughs> they defined minstrelsy and continued to do so long after their demise. Even a dozen years after they stopped performing, their con commentary was biting and memorable enough that the periodical The Nation asserted that some of the senators who were then in 1995 debating foreign policy so closely resemble the dialogue between Birch and Bacchus, the famous minstrels from the old days, that a great many people think them forgeries. And they even tempted those who should know better into using their material in the most unexpected places. John Anderson, a Presbyterian minister in Stockton, California, was invited by a congregation to speak on the subject of amusements. 
Not knowing anything at all about the topic, he spent six nights going to the San Francisco Minstrels establishment while they were in San Francisco. Three nights in the audience and three nights behind the scenes. His friend George Martin remembers. Between the close of the theater Saturday night and the hour of the service Sunday morning, he wrote his sermon. It was off color in some way, and it caused a terrible row. Some of the brethren threatened him with action by the presbytery. Perhaps it was the only time he was scared, because I never heard that he had any other views on amusements after that. <laughs> However, every time he went to New York City, he hunted up the San Francisco minstrels. Imagine Sam Clemens' delight. A minister threatened with a heresy charge and action by the presbytery. <laughs> all because of his favorite minstrels. The San Francisco minstrels are also mentioned in numerous memoirs and novels of the period as well. Emma Benedict Shepherd, writing of her childhood, said that the Negro minstrels were another amusement her father allowed. Billy Birch and Bacchus were the inn men, and they were great fun. They always managed to hit the public men or local politicians in their questions and answers. While Birch and Bacchus interestingly enough, were not actually performing while she was a child. Her, their news commentary in her later life was enough to color her memory of all minstrels. They became minstrelsy for her. That's what she remembered seeing as a child, even though she couldn't have. They weren't there. Um, another novel of the period asserts that the San Francisco Minstrels Hall was packed on Saturday afternoons with Wall Street brokers roaring over the personal jokes that were given by those never-to-be-forgotten end men, Billy Birch and Charlie Bacchus, which they had prepared for them overnight. It emphasizes their focus on what was happening in New York on a day-to-day -day basis, and numerous people came to hear and see what they were going to say. James Fisk, the financier, also known as Diamond Jim, was apparently a regular at their theater, among others. Of the many anecdotes that are related in the New York papers, a favorite of mine is about Bacchus's reply to an unidentified public figure who didn't appreciate being lampooned on the blackface stage and let it be known that he was going to come and shoot and kill Bacchus. The actor's response was brief and deadpan. He sent a telegram that said simply, Kill Birch. He has no child. I have. <laughs> Charlie Bacchus was this incredible impersonator. One night when he was sick and he couldn't go on stage in his own theater, he was wandering around the streets of New York and he ran into a friend of his who dragged him into a theater where Joseph McCullough, the famous Shakespearean actor, was performing. And they sat down and they watched the show. His friend complained that Charlie muttered through the entire performance. You could just hear him. And he was just irritated. And he got out into the, um, the foyer as the show was ending. And he was about to castigate Charlie. Why are you doing this? When all of a sudden, Charlie just broke out in a dead-on impersonation of Joseph McCullough, but saying the most horrible things. He stopped in the middle of it and said to the audience, who was just rolling and laughing, he said, that's the beginning. You want to see the rest of it? Come to my theater tomorrow night. <laughs> and he walked out. He didn't tell them who he was or where his theater was. He just walked out. I found the program. He did it. The next night, I have the day that it was in the newspaper. The next night, he's got Charlie Bacchus doing Joseph McCullough. He's there. So he was hilarious. Um, and it's not, again, it's not what we expect to hear. It's not what we expect to see. It's not what we think of when we think of blackface minstrelsy. Again, a lot of their performances do have the flavor of what we expect, but a lot of it doesn't. A lot of it is very different. And it's, um, they would do all sorts of things. They did sing plantation songs, but they sang really surprising plantation songs, such as one about a former slave's determination 
to go back to the good old home because he has to escape from the Ku Klux Klan. And when he goes home, he's going to be a nice little colored lamb and run for Congress. <laughs> They sang urban-based songs that riotously challenged notion of blacks' natural servility. They perform skits that connect the plight of the working white poor with even upper-class blacks, which I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. I'm not going to be able to talk as long as I I could do this for hours. I've been doing this for 11 years. Um, but I do want to talk to you about a specific play they did because I think it has real bearing on Mark Twain's use of minstrel humor, particularly starting with Huckleberry Finn, where his use of it got a little bit different. This was a production that was done in the same year as Twain started writing Huckleberry Finn, and it's the one that I have the advertising poster here for. It was called Julius the Snoozer. And it is, on one level, a parody of the very upper class Booth Theater production of Julius Caesar, which made all sorts of controversial changes to Julius Caesar um, and was very pretentiously done. They called theirs Julius the Snoozer. And they modeled their Julius very closely after Boss Tweed, who had just been recently indicted, found guilty, put in prison, escaped, was trying to avoid extradition. There have been a couple scholars who've written about this play, and they focus mostly on Boss Tweed and the, pol the political commentary that's in there about Boss Tweed. And I find that fascinating. But I find much more fascinating someone they imported as an outsider expressly for this piece. And the person they imported and put into their play was a gentleman named PBS Pinchback, who was then the only mulatto governor of a state in the Union. He had been a senator from Louis a senator in Louisiana State Senate and had been elected to the U.S. Senate. At the time they mounted their production, he had been trying to take his seat in the U.S. Senate for three years. The, the members of the Senate had, for various specious reasons, refused to let him sit, had put forth all sorts of investigations. He had ingenuously admitted to some graft because, as we all know from Twain's famous quote about the criminal classes, everybody in Congress <laughs> took graft at this point. <laughs> but he admitted it, and they were using it as an excuse not to let him take his seat in the Senate because they were not ready to have a mulatto take a seat in the Senate. So he comes in the play, and as they're asking Julius the snoozer to redress all of these terrible things that are going on in the city, the tenements, the garbage, all of the horrific conditions of the poor, they're also asking for Pinchback to be allowed to have a seat. He says, he's all but tired to death from standing on his feet, a reference to the past three years trying to get into the U.S. Senate. Now, in the play, they take advantage of historical knowledge that we never have, that we don't have anymore, it's not common anymore. Pinchback, when he was elected to the Louisiana State Senate, was refused that seat as well. He went and he fought. He proved ballot box stuffing and intimidation and eventually by the Supreme Court of the state of Louisiana was awarded his seat in the Senate. And then he was later appointed lieutenant governor and then became governor of the state of Louisiana. The day after he won his Supreme Court case in Louisiana, a man shot at him in the streets, a mulatto man hired by the Louisiana Democratic Society shot at him. Pinchback pulled a weapon out from under his coat and returned fire, even though the street was filled with white people all around them. They were both arrested. No one was hurt except the two men were both mildly wounded. Pinchback went to the police. He was arrested at first, but when he told them the story, they immediately let him go, and he took his seat in the Senate. 
but it was national news that he carried a concealed weapon and he was willing to use it on the street. <laughs> so they import him to this piece. And he, throughout the play, keeps asking for his seat, and Brutus keeps asking him. And I wanted to read you some more of the play, but I know we're going to be running out of time here shortly, so I don't want to go over. But it's not the kind of broad dialect language that you expect, you know, that, that is the classic, you know, kind of dumb, darky kind of dialect that nobody ever spoke anywhere except on the minstrel stage. It's mock Shakespearean verse. Um, it's full of rhyme, it's full of wit, it's pretty funny. He keeps asking for his seat, they keep asking for redress to the poor. Tweed, all of the snoozer, says, no, you know, unless you pay me a lot. Mm -hmm. Pay me a lot, I'll do it. Don't pay me, forget it. <clears throat> In their version, it's not Brutus who strikes the first blow, and the first blow on Caesar is not struck with a knife. PBS Pinchback pulls out a cannon, <laughs> shoots him with a cannon loaded with fireworks. <laughs> but here's the kicker, too. Right before Pinchback fires the cannon, one of the other actors in the play, one of the other members of the Senate, hits Julius in the, the snoozer, who's, we've got to remember, all these guys are in blackface, hits him in the face with a bag of flour restoring him to whiteface, upon which he is killed with a cannon by an outsider who is known in real life to carry a gun. It's funny. It's uncertain what they meant by this. It's amazing to me that putting this on in the months before Reconstruction fell apart and federal troops were removed from the South and the unholy compromise was signed. It's amazing to me that they not only didn't get lynched, <laughs> but they were allowed to continue and people kept coming to the show. They played the show quite a lot. They knew that people would want to know. Because here's the thing. They were mocking the production of Julius, the C Julius Caesar, which had started in December and ran for over a hundred nights. But they were also engaging in the fact that once and for all, two weeks before they went on stage, or actually it's eight days before they put it on stage, so just a week before they put it on stage, the U.S. Senate finally and irrevocably said, you may not have a seat in the Senate. The country was holding its breath wondering what this man was going to do. Was he going to take it? You know, last time he fought for his seat and he shot somebody. <laughs> that was just the state senate seat. They were wondering what was he going to do about a federal seat. Let me skip to... Sorry, lost my lost train of thought on that one, which is not good when you're on a podcast, you'll edit it out. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the nice things about it. Anyway, the question is, what did they mean by this? There have been some interesting studies of satire that have been done recently, specifically on Stephen Colbert's show, that show that people have a tendency to take out of satire what they bring in. When conservatives watch Stephen Colbert, they find him hilarious. And they think he's mocking liberals. When liberals watch Colbert's show, they think he's hilarious. And they think the conservative persona is mocking conservatives and that conservatives need to get a sense of humor. You know, it goes both ways. People have a tendency to take out whatever they bring in. This has always been true with satire. It's part of satire's power. And it's part of the reason for the San Francisco minstrel's success. Whether you were a member of the audience who thought Pinchback should have gotten his seat, whether you were a member of the audience who thought 
people like Pinchback shouldn't be allowed anywhere but in the stables and in the streets sweeping up. Whether you were somebody who was angry and filled with horror at the conditions in New York at the time, you laughed. And it was funny. And Pinchback wasn't presented the way the newspapers of the day presented him and the way he said that they presented him. He complained that they, they presented him as a caricature and not even human. On the San Francisco minstrel stage, he was incredibly human. And not only that, he was a man who was mad as hell and not willing to take it anymore. And they embraced that. As I said, Mark Twain started writing Huckleberry Finn during this same year. People have been frustrated by, hurt by, what they saw, the minstrel show exchanges between Huck and Jim, or the minstrel characterizations of Jim in that novel. And while I'm writing a lot about that in my book, I'm not actually going to talk about that, because what I want to close with is the one genuine minstrel scene in the book. There is one absolutely genuine minstrel scene in the book. It's when Huck's father has kidnapped him and taken him to the woods in Illinois. He's got him kidnapped. He's left him there for three days. He comes back, and Huck says he's all over mud from the gutter. I wouldn't have recognized him from Adam. I wouldn't have known him from Adam. Huck, Huck's dad, Huck's pap is in blackface. He is covered with mud. And he goes off on a political rant. Now the other thing that I want to say quickly is saying that he's all over mud from the gutter, I wouldn't have known him from Adam, is something that minstrel show stages, minstrel show audiences of the period would have recognized immediately. Because one of the oldest chestnuts on the minstrel stage is also a story that is one of the oldest is, is a very old one in the African-American community and one that audiences would have recognized. The story goes something like this. In the beginning, Adam and Eve were black just like everyone else. Okay, absorb that for a minute. They were black just like everyone else. After they ate the apple, they hid from God. God was walking through the garden. They got scared. They got so scared they turned white and deaf. I love the and deaf part. And the story winds up, and that, my brethren, is why we've been troubled with white trash ever since. Sometimes the story is told with Cain, about the murder of Cain and Abel, and again, it starts out, they were black like everyone else. And then there are some wonderful versions about Cain, you know, Cain committing that first murder and then hiding from hiding from God. And drag there are some wonderful versions where he's dragging the body around for 17 days trying to hide it. He finally finds a place to hide it. God's like, where's Abe? Don't know, man. <laughs> Don't know where he is. Where's Abel, don't, don't know. Where's Abel? Cain turns pure white. <laughs> All his children were white. And once again, this is why we've been troubled with white trash ever since. <laughs> now in the African American community, it's an inversion on stories of the time that were meant to denigrate their race, that were meant to set them as lower than, or different than, or criminal, right? And to invert that, and to say, no, it was the other way around, right? Obviously, guys. Now, when a white minstrel put on blackface and used the same number, it still carried those overtones a bit. But it also carried the overtones of anger. Yeah, white trash were the first ones who could see good and evil. White trash were the first ones to sin. White trash were the first ones to kill. Come on. It was a symbol of anger. 
It was rage. It was frustration. It was the cry of a group of people who were mad as hell and not willing to take it anymore. Pap's routine goes on where he complains about a mulatto professor from Ohio who can vote. Now, scholars have dismissed that for years, saying, no, he couldn't vote in Ohio. The truth is, in Ohio, if he was almost as white as a white man, this mulatto, yes, he could have voted in Ohio. Because Ohio actually defined race differently than any other state in the region. And it was well known at the time. I even found a Supreme Court case where somebody tried to argue, argue Ohio precedent to say in Michigan, okay, this guy's really white. The judge just looked at him, didn't even let him get the case precedent out. He said, this ain't Ohio. It was well known. That was, and it was, it's a wonderful story that if anybody wants to hear, I can talk about. It, was, it involved a woman who was light-skinned and pretty and was charged with theft, and a theft that was a capital crime. The only, um, the only witness against her was a black man. Her, her lawyer successfully argued that she was actually white, and because it was illegal in Ohio for a black man to testify against a white woman, she walked. The Supreme Court was like, oh, yeah, done. <laughs> so legally, mulatto was different in Ohio than it was in Missouri. Ironically, at this time in Missouri, Twain, or um, Pap, who is saying, I won't vote, because this, this mulatto can vote. Ironically, Pap actually couldn't have voted. Because while Missouri didn't have laws about property requirements, they did have laws about residency. And Pap had not been in residence long enough, and recently enough, to be able to vote. So if he'd gone to the polls, he would have been turned down anyway. He's angry, and there's a lot more, there's a lot of historical, dense historical background in that scene, and dense political commentary in that scene, that we don't see, if we don't see it as blackface, and that we don't see if we don't understand what blackface meant to Twain. Um, it was something that was polyethnically offensive. It was something that was offensive across class lines. It was something that worked hard to offend and to remind people of what hurt. The disparate nature between the American dream and the people who had trouble grasping that dream in their actual life. Blackface for Twain was anything but inoffensive. I have some other things that I can pass around too, but do you have any questions? And I know, I know it's covering a huge amount of territory in, in a small, Yes, yes. You said you've been um, studying this particular aspect of Mark Twain for 11 years. How did you happen to get really interested in this one particular aspect? Okay, the question was, I've been studying this for 11 years, which is a long time. And I also want to thank the Mark Twain Center and El Myra College for letting me stay at Quarry Farm and kick off the next eight months on taking a sabbatical to finish this book. It will get done this time. Um, I got interested in it because as I was reading, the question was, how did I get interested in it? I got interested in it because as I was reading the critiques of minstrelsy and Twain, and as I was reading what they were saying, I kept feeling like I must not understand what they meant. Because what they were saying and what I was seeing didn't quite gel with me. I was like, but wait a minute. You know, like, they would talk about the, the debates between Huck and Jim about Solomon, right? About the baby being cut in half. 
Um, and and I, I was like, but he wins. You know, Jim wins. Yeah, it's kind of silly. But it's a legitimate, you know, he's got a legitimate grievance and there are legitimate things in there and it, it seemed odd to me. And then there were other places that I just didn't understand. I read the autobiography a lot because my brother had died in 1991 and reading about Gene and how Twain dealt with Gene's death got me through my own brother's death. But in looking through the autobiography, I ran across that passage where he talks about the real Nuger show. And it's just that, that hammer blow repetition. I just, I, I couldn't figure out what was going on. Nothing seemed to quite fit. And the more I looked, the more I realized nobody had really spent much time looking up the men that he named as exemplary. And one of the men he names actually may or may not have been part of the San Francisco Minstrels. His name was Billy Rice. And there are two Billy Rices. One of them was with the San Francisco Minstrels, and he was a female impersonator. And female impersonators on the minstrel stage, you know, they're usually portrayed, and sometimes were very portrayed as comic and making fun of black womanhood. But most of the female impersonators took it even more seriously than drag queens do today. They boasted that their, their wardrobes were real. They didn't use costumes. They cost thousands of dollars. They insured their wardrobes for thousands of dollars. They were very serious about it. They took voice training. Um, the two female impersonators, the San Francisco Minstrels, had the great Ricardo and Billy Rice, um, both boasted occasionally that um, People actually mistook them for women and sent them gifts and cards and marriage proposals <laughs> and things like that. Um, and Billy Rice once he used to do, he did this um, imitation of Sarah Bernhardt that called Sarah Hartburn. <laughs> and apparently she was in the audience once and she was laughing so hard she started crying and she fell over. They had to like stop the show and she came back out. She thought it was just hilarious what he did. There was also another Billy Rice who was a stump speaker, who I think is probably more likely the one that Twain liked. Um, and he's very controversial because in the 1870s when he was traveling around with the show, he was very mouthy and he would do things that were really outrageous. One of the things he did in 1873 was he did a chicken steel and razor wheeled and coon routine that was very common 20 years later. It was what was the kind of routines that, that Twain was arguing against. But in 1873, when he made the mistake of doing this, a black man from the gallery shot at him. And the bullet went through his wig an inch from his skull. And after that, his routines changed a bit. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it was like, the more, the more I looked, the more it was odd. Like, um, I, was, I was reading in a minstrel book from the 1940s that the whole thing made me feel like I was being kicked in the chest. I was like, people find this funny. This is horrible. This is like the most god-awful dehumanizing stuff. And what made it worse was that they thought it was funny. And then all of a sudden, in the middle of that book, I ran across the cane routine. And I was, and I burst out laughing. In the middle of special collections, I, I burst out, out loud laughing. And then I was like, <laughs> I'm laughing at a minstrel routine. This is not right. And I was, but it's funny. And it's not what I expect. And it is so different from everything else in that book that the more I dug, the more I kept digging, and the more I got hooked, and I, I just couldn't let it go. There's a video that John Byrd put online about why you do twin studies. And I said, it got me by the throat. That's, that's what I meant. It did. It grabbed me by the throat. It wouldn't let me go. I started doing it because I had to. It was just, it made it. Yeah. Did, did a minstrel troupe ever hire a black performer? Did the minstrel troupe ever hire a black performer? Yeah. The San Francisco minstrels? No. No. But they did work with, they apparently worked with black performers behind the stage. They wrote, so, some of the songwriters from the San Francisco Minstrels wrote songs for the African American Minstrels. Some of the African American Minstrels wrote songs that they did. Um, they worked back and forth. The thing, and this was another thing that made me know I was on the right track and I need to do this. 
At Charlie Backus's funeral in 1883, the New York Times makes a comment at the funeral that a minstrel troupe was there in person and they presented a pillow of white roses with a dove suspended over and it says they presented it. And when I first read it, I just read it, filed it, thought it was interesting, but the more I looked, I, I suddenly found out that Calendar's Georgian minstrels were black. So the troupe that gave him this incredible floral tribute at his funeral was a black troupe. And the New York Times didn't think it significant to mention that. So it meant that there was a lot more commerce back and forth, a lot more interaction back and forth than anybody that I know of has found, and I'm still looking to see what's there. Um, but they were not allowed to perform on the stage together. A little later, a horrible man named Haverly, who created the minstrel show that kind of we know, he actually did have huge companies that were black and white, but they didn't perform on the stage at the same time. It'd be like the white performers would go out, the black performers would go out, the white performers would go out, the black performers would go out. Yeah. Um, does the fact that the black-faced minstrel seem to have begun in San Francisco have anything to do with the, what was going on in San Francisco as far as the gold rush days? And people were, it was pretty wild there in the 1850s. People were coming from South America as well as all over our country. Uh, does that have something to do with the, the uh, tone of what was going on for entertainment? Okay. The question is, does the fact that they started out in San Francisco have to do with the tone of their entertainment? And I think for the San Francisco minstrels, it really does. They were out there for the gold rush. They were out there earlier. All of them traveled around. They did this world tour that included um, that included performances in Cairo, of all places. They went around the world. Um, but the fact that it was a wild and woolly town let them be a lot more radical. And there's actually a story that Charlie Backus entered the minstrel stage because he, he criticized a member of the California legislature and was censured for it, and so he joined he joined the blackface minstrel stage so he could make fun of people without getting in trouble. <laughs> but minstrelsy itself had started much earlier um, in the 1820s, in, and New York was a big part of that. And again, there are lots of different kinds of minstrelsy, but yeah, I'd say their minstrelsy, they were all originally from New York and New Jersey. And they all, like Twain, came out to San Francisco. They came out before the war, though. Like yeah. How would uh, black minstrel troops differ in some ways from the white troops? Okay, the question is how did the black minstrel troops actually differ from the white minstrel troops, the black blackface troops? The black minstrel troops called themselves genuine colored. Um, it's one of the things that I know is very significant about the use of the word nigger in. Twain's work and in this historical period is that black, black-faced minstrels were called colored, not niggers. Nigger was reserved for the anger of the white minstrels. Generally, the African Americans joined the black-faced minstrel stage in 1865. Some of them came in a little bit earlier, but there was an explosion of black, black-faced minstrels starting in 1865 because Tony Pastor started variety houses where white performers could perform without blackface. And so <laughs> performers that didn't like the blackface actually went and performed at his variety houses and it left lots of open spaces and the African American performers jumped right in. Their shows were different in that they had to worry a lot about how audiences perceived them. Their shows had a tendency to be very benign, almost no social and political commentary. The social and political commentary and bent that African American humor is known for was almost entirely absent from their routines. One of the things they did do that was very different, they'd have, you know, just kind of the, the corny sorts of jokes and exchanges back and forth. They had beautiful songs 
and they used genuine, they used their own music, although sometimes they actually did perform music by the white minstrels that they liked. Um, but one of the things that they would do at the end was they would do a genuine plantation number for their last number, where they would use the spirituals, where they would use the work songs, where they would, in many ways, subvert and undercut any of the dumb jokes they did in the first part of the show, because the last part of the show was breathtakingly beautiful. Now the problem is audiences primed for prejudice and primed for satire often thought that those scenes were supposed to be funny and took them that way. So it was very hard and actually African American critics and scholars since then have been very hard on the black blackface minstrels for participating in their own denigration and derogation which, if you actually look at what they were doing, they really weren't. And there was actually um, one of my favorite later Coon Age performers was Bob Cole, who worked with James Weldon Johnson and his brother Jay Rosamon Johnson. They had a troupe, they had a troupe together and they um, wrote songs for the minstrel stage. And they would do the very stereotypical things. Bob Cole was famous for his razor wheeled and chicken stealing coon routine kind of thing that he'd just do up at the top and be real darky kind of stuff. But then, and this is the part that got me, in 1906, the height of the lynching era, he would put on white face and go out there in the middle of his show and do an uptight white guy routine. <laughs> and and he, was, he was amazing. And I'd love to, I, he's like an avenue I want to go in next because I find it fascinating that James Weldon Johnson, the author of Autobiography of an Ex-Colored Man, actually wrote for the minstrel stage as well and wrote for Broadway and wrote all kinds of songs. And he also wrote what became the anthem of the civil rights movement, Lift Up Your Voice and, Lift Every Voice and Sing. Um, and he and his brother collected all the spirituals at the time. And to have them dismissed and their predecessors dismissed as just participating in their own denigration is, is wrong. Um, there are people who are looking at this now, looking at the history of black, black-faced performers and seeing it as very empowering, but I think there needs to be middle ground because I think it was hard. It was hard what they did, but they did it because they had to, like anybody else who performed. Anything else?